Well, thank you, Matthew, for these very generous words, and thank you all very much for your presence. It's a great delight to be back here in York. Um, this is a lecture about Niccolò Machiavelli and his best-known work of political theory, The Prince, Il Principe. But I want first to say a word about Machiavelli himself. A Florentine, born 1469, he first of all devoted himself to a life of public service. And it's an important fact about his biography that he wouldn't have expected uh, in his earlier years to have been the author of any work of politics. He devoted himself, as I say, to the service of the Republic, and he was indeed second chancellor of the Florentine Republic from 1498 until the sudden collapse of the Republic and the return of the Medici princes to power uh, in 1512. 1512 was a great year of crisis for Machiavelli. He was not only summarily removed from his position in the Second Chancery, but he became an object of suspicion to the Medicians, alleged to have taken part in a plot against the return of the Medici princes to power, and he was imprisoned and tortured. He is released from prison in a general amnesty at the beginning of 1513 but he is ordered to absent himself from the city. He is in compulsory exile from the city, living in his farm south of the city, overlooking it, but he's not permitted to re-enter that space. And that is the end of his public career. Tremendous division in his life, 1512, because from that time onwards he has no public role, no political office, and becomes the man of letters, the philosopher of politics, who, by, uh, who is known to posterity. Now, settling down early in 1513 in the countryside, in enforced leisure, which he hated, he writes a, a famous letter to his friend um, Vettori, uh, Francesco Vettori, in December of 1513, in which he says, well, how have I been occupying this enforced leisure? He says, well, I have just finished writing a little book, which is De Principatibus, Concerning Principalities. And he is referring clearly to the completion of his treatise, The Prince. Now, if Machiavelli began writing that little book, as he implies, as soon as he was let out of jail, then he began to write it exactly 500 years ago to the month. So it's this date, it's a great anniversary for Machiavelli scholars, the, the, the writing of The Prince, the beginning of the writing of The Prince, exactly 500 years ago in February or March uh, of 1513. So it's that date as well as the book that I want in a way to celebrate as well as to talk about this evening. So now let me turn from Machiavelli to his text, to the Principe. As I'm sure you know, there's a pivotal chapter in this book. It's a book of, what, 26 chapters, the last being this formal rhetorical exhortatio to the Medici to restore Italian unity, but the previous 25 chapters being this analysis of how to gain and hold power. The pivotal chapter, I think, is chapter 15, in which Machiavelli declares that his aim in writing the book is to offer practical advice about statecraft. And his basic aim, he says at the end of the book, is, this is chapter 24, to offer advice to new princes. He's not interested in uh, established princes. If you've inherited your principality and you can't hold on to it, then you're too incompetent to be worth thinking about. He's only interested in new princes who have the greatest difficulty. And the aspiration, as he nicely puts it, is to make new princes look like well-established ones. That's the practical aim of the advice. Now, he discusses rulers of antiquity and rulers of the present time, both as sources of exemplar. Of course, the, the idea of operating with examples as much as with arguments, very typical feature of uh, Renaissance rhetorical culture. So, as you would expect, no doubt, uh, all the, the princes, all the political leaders whom he discusses in antiquity and in his own time are men. Um, and that means that the vocabulary of the prince is quite a heavily gendered vocabulary and not to be anachronistic, I'm going to um, have to follow it. But let's notice at the outset that not all the rulers whom Machiavelli discusses were, in fact, men. One whom he mentions with great admiration, both in the Principe and later in the Discorsi, 
is a woman, Caterina Sforza. And as we shall see, everything that he has to say about the requisite qualities for political leadership would apply to women rulers as much as to male rulers. Now, there is one indispensable quality, or rather set of qualities, that any political leader, man or woman, any political leader must possess, according to Machiavelli, if they are to succeed in their leadership. And this is the quality which, in the Italian, is called virtu. Now, this word, la virtu, it's the same in the plural, le virtu, echoes throughout the book. It occurs once in Latin. As perhaps you know, of course, the book is in Italian, but the chapter headings of this book are in Latin. And chapter 6 has the Latin form, virtus. Um, that's the only occurrence of it in Latin in the whole text. But it, for those who like precision, the word virtu, either in the singular or the plural, occurs 60 times in this extremely short book. So that's an average of getting on for once per page. It's absolutely pivotal to the argument of most of the chapters, this notion of princely virtu. And so correspondingly, it seems to me, the pivotal task of the interpreter of this book is to understand what he meant when he used that crucial term. Now, Machiavelli never supplies a formal definition. That's not his way. He's not Hobbes, as it were. Um, and it's true to say that he uses the, the, the term virtu in a quite wide variety of contexts, so wide that it's become quite standard to say in the critical literature, uh, I quote, for example, Whitfield, that he uses the word without any consistency at all. Now, the first point I want to make is that I really don't agree with that. It seems to me that this term, pivotal to the argument, is used with complete consistency. It is applied throughout this brief book as the name of a set of qualities which Machiavelli wants to say several things about. I, I think I'm going to turn out to, to make four closely connected points here about how this terminology is in fact used. First, la virtu, virtu is said to be the name of the quality, or rather it's always a set of qualities, by means of which it is possible for a political leader, at least in part to control, and hence to offset, the power of fortuna, as he calls it, the power of luck, good luck or ill luck, in political affairs. I should say, and this I'm sure you know, Machiavelli believes that you can never get rid of the element of luck in political leadership. So, as he frequently implies, show me a successful political leader and I will show you someone who has been extremely lucky. I mean, what if John Smith had not had a heart attack? We would never have heard of Tony Blair. Wow. I mean, these people are fortunate. They're, they're, they're successful only because they're fortunate. But, of course although th there therefore cannot be a science of politics. I mean, that would be a grotesque mistake, according to Machiavelli. There couldn't be a science of politics, because that would forget the role of luck in politics, which is ex hypothesi, incalculable, but of great importance. Nevertheless, he says it's a great mistake of some ancient thinkers, and he cites Plutarch, to suppose that in politics everything is luck. For Machiavelli, much of it is judgment, and the relationship between luck and judgment is really one of the major themes of the book. Now, the quality that you have to possess if you're going to be able in any way to control the role of luck is virtu. And so one of the oppositions in the book is always between la virtu and la fortuna. Fortuna virtu. That comes out most explicitly in chapter 24, this concluding chapter on how the political leaders of Italy have in his own time so commonly lost their states, lost their principalities. And Machiavelli says, they blame Fortuna. They say this has been due to tremendous ill luck. But he says, and I quote, all these quotations are my own translations, by the way. Me, my translations are very literal. Um, Where one's defences are based upon one's own virtu, the capacity of ill fortune to take away one's power is limited. So although they they blame what they regard as their ill luck. They ought not to do so. Why not? Because, in fact, they're lacking in virtu. If they had this quality, 
it would have enabled them to offset, to control, to some degree, ill fortune. Now, there's the first claim. The second is a very closely associated claim, which is that love of two is also the name of the set of qualities which enable you... This is a kind of very useful, I think, uh, um, American idiom, which captures very well what Machiavelli is saying. You can get lucky. It's possible to get lucky. You shouldn't think of, of fortuna as the same as providence. It's not inexorable. It, it's possible in certain ways to ally with and to control fortune. Um, and if you ask, well, by what means is it possible, the answer is, again, la virtu. And this is the point that's brought out in chapter 6, which is in apposition to chapter 7, where the first discusses how you can seize and hold power by this quality of virtus, and the second discusses how you can do the same by means of fortune. So now these two qualities are being put in apposition in the organisation of the first part of the book. Now, in chapter 6, Machiavelli introduces another notion here which is connected with fortune. He says, sometimes, I'm quoting, you may have the good fortune to encounter the right uh, occasion. The, the Italian word is occasione. The, the, the right, we would have to say, moment of opportunity uh, to act. And he says, if you're not blessed with having the right opportunity to act, if you don't have that kind of fortune, and that is a piece of good luck, having occasione, having the right moment to act, then you're never going to succeed as a political leader at all. So to that degree, fortune is inexorable and present. But what it is to be a leader of year two is to seize opportunities. That's the quality that enables you to seize opportunities. So, in chapter 6, he follows this thought out with the discussion of the leaders, the three leaders whom he regards as having had the greatest virtue in the history of political leadership, Moses, Cyrus, Romulus. Well, Moses, he says, he cheated because God told him what to do, so that really doesn't count. Um, his favourite is Romulus, but of all of them, he says, and I quote, if their lives and actions are examined, it will be seen that they received from Fortuna nothing but occasione, nothing but the right circumstances in which to act. He agrees, without having had that particular occasion, um, their virtue would have been expended to no effect, but because they had such great virtue, no opportunity was wasted. And that was what made them successful political leaders. They grasped the opportunity and the quality that enabled them to do so was here too. Now, that brings me to the third of these four points I'm trying to make about this concept, um, which is also brought out in chapter six. Because, he says, political leaders with these qualities of here too are always able to seize opportunities, they are in turn able, and now comes a formula which echoes all through the book, they are able, the Italian says, mantenere lo stato. They're able to maintain their state. So virtu is the name of the quality that enables you to maintain your state. Maintain your state, mantenere lo stato, what does that mean? Lo stato in Machiavelli is, I think, quite deeply ambiguous. Of course, in modern Italian, lo stato just means the state. Um, and that notion is not absent in Machiavelli, I've come to think. But fundamentally what he means by being able mantenere lo stato is to maintain your state, i.e. As a, as a ruler, as a political leader. That's to say, to maintain your standing, your status as a political leader. Um, what you want to avoid is what the French at this time were already calling a coup d'etat. That's to say, any strike against the etat, meaning your etat, your state, your condition or um, standing as a ruler. But if you're going to maintain your position, then obviously what you've in fact got to maintain is the jurisdictions and territories that have been given into your charge. And that, of course, brings out the other notion of lo stato. That sounds very like the state. And it's true that if you're going to maintain your state, il suo stato, you have to maintain the state, lo stato, the institutions, the jurisdictions of the state. And indeed, the very first sentence of the whole book 
uses this notion of state in a remark for the age a remarkably abstract way because he says all the states that there have been uh, tutti di stati all the states that have been have either been principalities or republics so notice the notion of a state is something that could be either a principality or a republic so it's a rather abstract notion of some set of institutions which could take different constitutional forms so what Machiavelli wants to say is, all right, that's your task. You've got to be able to maintain your state, avoid a coup d'etat, and the quality that enables you to do that is this quality, la virtu. So he ends chapter six by talking about a not celebrated prince, but I think actually the real hero of the book, and he's called Hero. So Machiavelli would have noticed that. Um, chapter six ends by discussing hero of Syracuse, and I quote. From being an ordinary private citizen, he became the sole ruler of Syracuse. It is true that he enjoyed a fine opportunity, occasione, but apart from that, his success owed nothing to Fortuna, but everything to the fact that he was a man of outstanding virtu, and as a result, although he found it difficult to acquire power, he had no trouble in managing mantenere lo stato. Why? Because he was of outstanding virtu. Now, Machiavelli notes in chapter 19 that this point, which is really the core of the book, how you maintain your state, could be put another way around. What have you got to be absolutely sure you don't do if you're going to avoid a coup d'etat, if you're going to maintain your state? And he says, there are two things you must avoid, like a shoal. He says, I mean, the idea here, of course, being the sh you're steering the ship of state. Don't steer it into the shoals. Now, how, wh what are these shoals? There are two things that must be avoided at all costs. One is being hated and the other is being despised. And he illustrates the point in chapter 19 with a, a, a brief history uh, of the late emperors of Rome. Antoninus was hated, so he quite soon lost his state. Pertinax and Alexander were despised. So they quite soon they lost their state. Commodus was hated and despised. <laughs> so he maintained his state for a very short time. By contrast, neither Marcus Aurelius nor Septimius Severus, Machiavelli's two favourite political leaders of antiquity, were ever hated or despised. Although, of course, Severus, as his name implies, was very greatly feared. He was feared but not hated. And that is, of course, part of the trick. And as a result, both of them managed, without any difficulty, Mantanelli lo Stato, to maintain their state. And if you ask why this is so, he says, they both possessed extra extraordinaria virtu, extraordinary virtu. Now, it's true that Machiavelli, throughout this book, is at least as much concerned with how you can get power as with how you can manage to maintain it, Mantanelli lo Stato. But... And, of course, chapters 1 to 11 are, are largely about getting power as well as holding on to it. But notice that you can get power in all sorts of ways. You can get power because you may inherit it. I mean, it may be a hereditary principality. You can get power because it may be that you're elected into this particular kind of principality. For example, the papacy. Just happened, hasn't it? Um, that's an elected principality. So that's another way you can come to power. You can also come to power by mere good fortune. The only way that you can maintain power, however, is just one way, is by virtu. Let me turn to the fourth and final point that I think Machiavelli wants to us to understand about this notion of virtu. But to appreciate this final point, you have to see that we are in the high Renaissance here. We're at the beginning of the 16th century. And we are in a, a scale of political values very foreign to us in a democratic society. And Machiavelli wants to say, this goal, which is the fundamental goal of princes, being able mantenere lo stato, is not the main goal of the prince. It's the fundamental one. If you can't manage to hold on to the apparatus of power, then, then you're over. There's nothing to say to you. But it isn't the goal you should be setting yourself. The goal you should be setting yourself, and here we have the high Renaissance speaking, is glory, la gloria. What you have to do as a prince is to do great things, grande cose. You've got to do great things. 
of such a kind as will bring you glory, and so much glory now that posthumously you attain fame. Fame is posthumous, which is why you must always be polite to historians, because <laughs> they are in charge of your fame, but they're not in charge of your glory. That is what you can aspire to. And so it's the figure of the virtuoso who gains glory, this the figure of glory that Machiavelli wants you to focus on. Of course, virtuoso now would just mean someone extremely good at playing the violin in public, <laughs> or, or the piano, or something like that. That would be a virtuoso, a virtuoso. But you see the connection, because when you watch these people in action, they are amazing, aren't they? Uh, and, you know, they, they, they're glorious figures. They bring the house down. Now, this discussion of glory uh, is also very much Machiavelli's theme in chapter 19, um, when he discusses Severus uh, and Marcus Aurelius, because he says both were able not merely to remain in power, but to attain so much glory that they died venerated by all. Okay, there it is, as far as I can see, that's to understand this pivotal notion in the book, that if you wish to attain glory, if you wish to maintain your state, if you wish to overcome and control fortuna, the answer in every case is the same. You need this quality of virtu. So there it is. Well, you might say, well, that's extremely unhelpful, because what is this quality? or this set of qualities. We, we want a list, don't we? I mean, so far I've just given you the heuristics of it, but you want to know, yeah, but what, what is this thing? Virtu, la virtu, les virtu. What does it? Right. Now, Machiavelli is writing his book in a culture and at a time when there was a considerable literature devoted to exactly that question. And I now want to talk for a moment about this literature and Machiavelli's relationship to it. When I say a literature of advice book to princes, I'm thinking of a number of Italian texts, Latin texts of the last part of the 15th century. Giovanni Pontano writes a book called De Principe. Bartolome Sacchi writes a book called De Principe. Um, uh, um, Francesco Patrizzi writes a book called De Reggae concerning the king. So, Notice that Machiavelli, Il Principe, that's gone into the Italian from the Latin, and that's a very important moment in, uh, in Italian literature, the move from Latin to Italian for a learned treatise like this one is the move made by Machiavelli. But all these writers, De Principe, are writing about the quality that they call virtus. Now, they completely agree with what is said in the next generation by Machiavelli, that virtus is the name of the quality that, in, that brings you glory. As Pontano says, and I'm translating, virtus alone is the source of glory. But these writers also want you to have a list. They want you to have a list of what the qualities are that go to make up the virtus of the prince. And the, the account is very clear, and they all agree. There's one fundamental quality that you have to have, and it is the political virtue, and it is justice. I quote Saki, a society will remain firm only if it is governed with justice. If justice is neglected, it will die. Justice is the foundation of a prince's perpetual acclaim and glory. To which Pontano adds, quoting Cicero, I quote again, the essential element in justice consists in fides, that's to say faith, keeping faith, meaning keeping your promises, never breaking your word. Nothing, I'm quoting again, is more despicable than failing to keep your word. The watchword, and here he is quoting Cicero again, must be fides sit servanda. Good faith must always be served, must always be kept. That is actually a maxim of the Roman law that they're citing, but also it's to be found in Cicero. The foundation of justice is fides, keeping your word. Fides sit servanda. That must, above all, be upheld. 
So there's one classical thought, essentially a Ciceronian thought. But their classicism is broader than that, and uh, as Peter Stacey, in a major recent book on um, the classical origins of Renaissance theory of principalities, brings out, we should cite here not just Cicero, but Seneca. Seneca, the tutor to Nero, bad luck, that was, um, <laughs> uh, wrote two treatises of advice for princes, one of which is called the De Beneficiis, in which he is talking essentially about the giving and receiving of benefits, and thus about the virtue of liberality in princes, generosity, liberality. And so there is one of the two of what he calls the princely virtues. The other princely virtue is the subject of his incomplete treatise, which he addressed to Nero, which is called De Clementia, concerning clemency. Now, what liberality and clemency have in common, which makes them specifically princely virtues, notice, is that they go beyond justice. Um, being generous or being liberal is more than being just. Being clement is more than being just. And, of course, princes have a prerogative of clemency. They can cancel the law and insert mercy instead. So these are the special features of princely morality. So, you could summarise by saying that the standard classical humanist view current in Machiavelli's society is that there are three princely virtues and that they are justice and generosity and clemency. Now, if we turn back to what I call the pivot of the book, chapter 15, what we see is that Machiavelli is engaging with exactly this tradition of thought. And he says, and I'm quoting chapter 15, I am well aware that many people have written about this subject of princely virtu already. Clear reference to exactly the literature I've just cited. And he goes on, I fear, he doesn't of course mean that at all, I fear that I may be thought presumptuous, for what I have to say departs from the precepts offered by these other writers on this subject, and then the Italian says, massime, it departs massively from what these idiots, these people have been <laughs> saying. And then he proceeds, it's a, this famous sequence of chapters from chapter 15. The next chapter, chapter 16, is called De Liberalitate, concerning liberality. The next chapter after that is called De Crudelitate et Pietoso, concerning cruelty and clemency. And then chapter 18 is on fides, the keeping of your word, the foundation of justice. So having introduced the idea that he's going to depart massively from what is normally said, he alerts you to the literature that he's talking about by singling out these three particular qualities. So the question is, what is this massive departure? Because that's to get inside the structure of the book, I would submit. And to understand the title of this lecture, How Machiavellian Was Machiavelli, we need to focus on these chapters. Well, I think myself that these chapters could be said to have a kind of um, essential answer to that question, which is that all the elements of princely virtue as commonly understood in classical and Renaissance humanism are treated by Machiavelli purely instrumentally. By which I mean that the, the fundamental argument, I think, is that here are these qualities and that you should follow them insofar as they're helpful to your basic task, which you remember is mantenere lo stato, and you should not follow them if they get in the way of that task. So for Machiavelli, the key question in political morality is always framed consequentially. So he's not really interested in the idea of a virtue, that's to say a quality that absolutely forbids you to do certain things. For him there is no such quality, because the consequentialism is such that in respect of any given action, you must always ask, will this action, which is liberal or which is clement or which is just, help me to maintain my state. If it will, do it. If it won't, don't. And so the princely judgment, and this is what virtu is, is judging when that is right. 
Now, that's then applied to each of these virtues. And first, as I've said, to the virtue of liberality, the topic of chapter 16. I quote, and this is how the chapter begins, it is very good to be held to be liberal. But remember your basic task, mantonelli lo stato. And then for Machiavelli, the problem is, I quote again, practicing liberality can lead to your being hated by those whom you will have to tax heavily in order to sustain your reputation as a man of liberality. But don't forget what happens if you're hated, you'll soon lose your stake. There's no exceptions to that. So Machiavelli's advice here in chapter 16 is, I quote, a prudent prince will therefore not mind being called miserly. Such miserliness is a vice, but it is one of those vices that enable a prince to rule. What about the second princely virtue, clemency? He starts again by affirming, and even more strongly than in speaking of liberality, I quote, every prince ought to want to be considered to be merciful and not cruel. But remember your basic task, Mantonelli lo stato. And he adds, once you see that, you will recognize clemency can be badly used, mal usata, can be badly used. He gives the example of Cesare Borgia, I quote, who was harsh and cruel, but his harshness and cruelty reformed his principality. It was due to his cruel measures that he succeeded in unifying the Romagna, uniting it, bringing it loyalty, bringing it peace. Only by cruelty did he manage Mantonelli lo Stato. What finally about um, chapter 18 on the fundamental virtue of the prince, Fides, justice. Now, here I think he wants to make the same point um, even more forcibly, which is, of course, keeping your word is a great, uh, a great virtue, but, as he says, always keeping your word, you will find, and in a very simple form in, in the Italian, he says, it's, it's, uh, it'll, torni contro, it'll, it'll turn against you if you always keep your promises. So the question is always, will the keeping of this promise endanger or help to maintain the state? If it will endanger it, don't keep it. If it will help, then keep it. And this advice, that you should take a completely instrumental view of the virtue of justice, he says, is confirmed by experience. I quote the chapter, experience shows that in our times, in Austri Tempi, those princes who have done great things, gran cose, are those who have held the keeping of their word to be of no significance. And the great example, he says, is the Pope. He, he would have no idea what it was like to keep his promise, but has been very successful. I hope the conclave will keep that in mind. Though. So the basic doctrine is very economically summarized in the title of chapter 18. Now, the title of chapter 18, it's impossible to recapture how shocking this title would have been at the time. Remember, fide sit servanda. That's the watchword for the prince, the watchword for the prince. The title of chapter 18 of, prince, of Machiavelli's prince is quo modo, how far, fide sit servanda. How far should you keep your promises? So what's an order, fide sit servanda, good faith must always be kept, is turned into a question, quo modo, how often, how far? That's for Machiavelli, the question. And that would have seemed, as it did, uh, almost an unbelievable moment of um, political wickedness. Now, the second thing that Machiavelli wants to say about fides is, well, look, people really care about, about fides, and how was it that Pope Alexander VI never kept his promises but was so successful? Well, he says, because he was brilliant at dissembling. And that's what you must become as a prince and hence the famous image of the fox. People will gravely object if they can see that you're but someone who doesn't care about promise keeping. So it mu you must minimize the extent to which they can see that. Otherwise, you're a fool. And of course, the figure of the fool who thinks that it's in line with reason not to keep your promises, who recurs in, in um, Hobbes' Leviathan, is clearly the figure of Machiavelli. Um, so don't be a fool, he's saying. Uh, you must dissemble as much as you possibly can. 
And that leads to the summary of M Machiavelli's argument, and I'll read it. It must be understood that a ruler, and especially a new ruler, cannot always act in ways that are considered good, are held to be good, tenuto buono, because in order, mantenere lo stato, he is often forced to act contrary to good faith, contrary to humanity, contrary to clemency, contrary to liberality. He should not depart from the good when that is possible, but he must know how to enter into evil ways when that is necessary, necessitato. Now, the revolutionary claim is that's the virtuoso prince. That's all part of the virtu of the prince. And so you end with the thought, not that I'm going to end with this thought, because I've come to think this is a crude analysis of Machiavelli, but fundamentally the thought is that the prince must be someone willing to do evil that good shall come of it. That, that is, as it were, the basic message of the book. Now, I, I think that that sort of is the basic message of the book. Um, or rather, I think that that is definitely what he wants to say about the virtue of justice. But if we turn to the other two crucial princely virtues, liberality and clemency, I've come to be much less clear that that is actually what he wants to say. So hence the title of this talk, How Machiavellian Was Machiavelli? In respect of justice, the traditional picture of Machiavelli, namely he is the person who tells you to do evil, that good may come of it, if you think that that's the right judgment. That, I think, that goes through. That is the argument about justice. But I don't think that is the argument about either clemency or liberality. I think it's a far more rhetorical argument. And I think it has very deep classical roots, and it gives us a somewhat different Machiavelli, and I would like to end with it. What I think Machiavelli basically wants to say about the other two princely virtues is that the, if the following of what are held to be examples of liberality and clemency have the effect of ruining you, of your losing you your state, then how can they be the name of the virtues? Because notice, he said that the quality of virtu is the quality that causally brings about success in maintaining your state. But you've just said, well, it doesn't. But notice what's underlying this is a phrase that we would still use. These are the qualities by virtue of which you're able to maintain your state. So there's a question mark against the idea that it makes any sense to say that was an act of great liberality, but unfortunately um, it didn't help you to maintain your state. Do we really understand these virtues is what Machiavelli is, I think, saying. So there's something deeply rhetorical going on here. And what exactly is it? Well, the ultimate classical source for what I've come to think is going on in this part of Machiavelli's text is one of the great moralists of antiquity, according to the Renaissance, Thucydides. We think of Thucydides as an historian, and of course he writes the history of the Peloponnesian War, but he was thought of as one of the great realist moralists of antiquity. And there is a crucial passage which resonates through the Renaissance from uh, Thucydides' history, which is the discussion in Book 3 of when civil war broke out in one of the city-states, that's to say, Corsaira. Now, I'm not saying that Machiavelli knew this text, although it's very striking. One of the great philological achievements of the High Renaissance was the first ever Latin translation of Thucydides, directly from the Greek into Latin, made by Lorenzo Valla, in uh, 1452, but printed as early as 1483 and widely available in print in Italy in the generation just before Machiavelli is writing. He may not have read the book, but th this particular discussion was very widely known. So what does Thucydides say in this famous passage? In talking about it, I'll, I'll use Valor's translation, which I shall in turn translate, just to avoid any anachronism. What Thucydides says is that when civil war breaks out, the very first casualty is moral language, because people will try to seize moral language for their partisan purposes. And I now quote the Valor translation. As soon as war breaks out, people will begin to excuse merely reckless behavior by redescribing it as courage. Temeritas will be called fortitudo. 
and they will begin to excuse slackness and slowness to act by calling them instances of honourable cautiousness. And they will begin to re-describe and even to excuse mere ill-temper and rage by calling them instances of true manliness. Now, Matt, uh, um, Thucydides says the opposite can also happen. I quote once more. As soon as conflict broke out in Corsara, not only were evil acts excused as instances of virtue, but good actions were denigrated. So modesty came to be re-described and condemned as nothing more than cowardice. And careful and prudent deliberation came to be dismissed as mere lack of decisiveness. Now, Thucydides is writing as a moralist. He is saying that's what happens under civil war. Moral language corrupts. It's seized by factions. But in later generations, that very powerful moral passage is picked upon by the rhetoricians. We don't know how early, but the earliest rhetorician who picks this up is the greatest in the history of rhetoric, namely Aristotle, in book one of his Art of Rhetoric. Now, again, I'm not saying Machiavelli knew this text, but I, I should add that it was translated in Florence in the 1470s by Giorgio Trebizond into Latin. Machiavelli was bilingual in Latin. The text is very freely available in Florence at the time, so he may well have known it too. So what happens when Aristotle picks up Thucydides, he gives all the same examples, is that instead of saying, look, this is a terrible thing that happens morally in circumstances of civil war, he says, look, here's a good rhetorical trick you can try. You can try re-describing recklessness as courage. So instead of this being presented in moralistic terms, it's presented in rhetorical terms. He's saying, you know, this is something you, you, know, you could try at home. Now, he gives examples um, uh, of how the virtues could be denigrated. He gives Thucydides examples, but he's much more interested, as a rhetorician is bound to be, in how you can manipulate moral language in order to excuse vices. And he not only gives Thucydides' example, which is, I'm quoting Georgia Trebizond now, mere ferocity being re-described and indeed commended as courage. The ferox is called fortis. But then Aristotle adds lots of examples, so far as we know they're his own. Of course, they may have come from some earlier um, rhetorician, but in the history of rhetoric, we know these as Aristotle's examples of how you can excuse the vices. He says, hmm, you could try re-describing a completely simple-minded person as very good-natured. You could try re-describing a completely cold and emotionless person as particularly calm and gentle. You could... Uh, try re-describing someone who is almost always furious as remarkably frank. <laughs> you could try describing someone who is appallingly arrogant as remarkably dignified. You could try describing someone who is invariably extravagant as extremely generous. These are all Aristotle's examples, and they flow into the rhetorical tradition. They're picked up by the greatest of the Roman rhetoricians, Quintilian, who gives it a name, Paradiastolus excusing vices by re-describing them by the names of the neighbouring virtues. And the examples that Quintilian gives are simply translations of Aristotle's examples. And that understanding of what Paradiastole is, namely excusing um, vices, the act of excusing vices by re-describing them as virtues, then goes into the later rhetorical tradition, the medieval tradition in particular, because Isidore picks this up in his encyclopedia, quoting Quintilian word for word, and then in the Renaissance, the new, uh, the, the revival of, of rhetoric in the Renaissance, people like Mancinelli, for example, De Figuris, they simply repeat Quintilian all over again. So there's one strand that comes down in the history of rhetoric of that kind. However, 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 there is another strand, and that goes back to the original Thucydidean position. But if you think about it, you can adapt that to rhetoric as well. And the claim is that the rhetorical trick is not re-describing the vices as virtues, but pointing out that that's what people are doing. Of course, that's what Thucydides is doing. He's pointing out that in circumstances of civil war, vices get re-described as virtues. 
So there's a rhetorical tradition which says, look, that's what paradiastole is. It's not the act of redescription. It's pointing out that this act of redescription is going on, that we're living in stupendously corrupt times, that the virtues and the vices have all got muddled up. And uh, in, in the Roman tradition, uh, there are a number of texts in which that rival understanding of how to think about paradiastole is picked up. Rutilius Lupus, but above all, the most important text from Roman antiquity and in the Renaissance picks it up, and that is the anonymous Rhetorica ad Herennium. Now, this is a quite unpretending text, but it was the way that you learnt rhetoric I at school and at university in the Italian Renaissance, and indeed in the English Renaissance. Uh, you learnt it, first of all, at school, um, in the sixth form, as it was still, it was already called the sixth form, in any grammar school, it was also called the rhetoric school class. The, the sixth form was the rhetoric class. Why? Because you studied rhetoric. What did you study? The ad herenium. You have to think of a culture that knew this text by heart. And Machiavelli certainly learnt his rhetoric from it. And Virginia Cox, in a classic article, showed how the structuring of the whole discussion of the Ernesto and the Utile in Machiavelli is taken directly from the ad herenium. So he knows this text, and this is the text which says the, the rhetorical trick is not redescribing the virtues as the vices as the virtues, it's pointing out that that's going on, and that that's the forensic thing to do. And that shows you that your opponent is a corrupted person. Now, what I want to end by noting is that this is what is going on in these famous chapters of Machiavelli's, chapter 16 and chapter 17. So let me turn back to them and just finish at this point. Chapter 16, De Liberalitate. It's desirable, Machiavelli begins, I quoted him already saying this, to be held to be generous. However, he goes on, I quote, if you practice generosity in the way that will enable you to sustain among men of the present time the name of being a generous man, what you will in fact find it is necessary to do is to omit no element of extravagance, suntuosita, the Italian says, and to such an extent that you will in the end consume the entirety of your resources. So, Machiavelli is saying, what passes in our society of the present time, in Austri Tempi, as he says, as the virtue of liberality, is in fact the vice of extravagance, which is being excused. That's what Machiavelli is pointing out. People go around talking about princes as liberal, but actually they're describing extravagance. What about the next chapter, when we come to the virtue of clemency? Well, again, Machiavelli says, actually what I have to point out is that when people get praised for clemency in in Austri Tempi, in our times, what is being praised is actually not a virtue, but a vice. And he gives two examples. I quote, The Florentines, in order to avoid being called cruel, refused to intervene to stop an uprising in Pistoia, with the result that the whole town was destroyed. But while the Florentines congratulated themselves on their clemency, they gave a wrong description of their behaviour. This was not clemency. This was being Troppo pietoso. This was overindulgence. They could have killed the ringleaders and saved the town, instead of which they left the ringleaders and the entire town was killed. How is that clemency? These are corrupt people. That's not clemency. That is just overindulgence. The second example is, um, again, it's very hard to recapture this. This would have been unbelievably shocking in Machiavelli's time. The second example is Scipio, one of the most revered heroes of the Roman Republic, and revered above all for his clemency. Machiavelli says he wasn't clement at all. He's living in a society in which what he did was corruptly called clemency, but it wasn't actually clemency. Two examples are given. One is he forgave a mutiny. There was promptly another mutiny. So a large number of people were killed who didn't have to be killed. So how is that clement? He says, that's not clement. That's troppo pietoso. That's, again, that's just overindulgence. He should have known what military discipline required, and then there wouldn't have been a second mutiny. Second example he gives, um, one of Scipio's legates allowed a city in Calabria to be destroyed. Scipio, to avoid a reputation for cruelty, refused to punish anyone involved in um, 
destroying the city. How is that clemency, Machiavelli says? That's not clement. And what he says is, that is an example of una natura facile. That's just someone who is completely lax. They don't care. And that is the celebrated Scipio. He's not clement. He's, he's lax. He's overindulgent. People don't understand the true virtue. So, we live in a corrupted society in which people think that what is in fact extravagance is liberality. Now he says, consider Louis XII. Everyone says, well, what a terrible man. He was extremely parsimonious. Machiavelli says, and I quote, yes, as a result of that parsimony, he was able to fight all wars without ever raising taxes. I call that generous. Because it led to no rapacious demands upon the people. And that enabled him to maintain his state. Now the paradox is resolved. This is true virtue, because it does help you mantenere your stato. But you have to understand what the true virtue of liberality is. Second example, Cesare Borgia. He was called cruel, but his methods brought peace, stability, good fortune, and prosperity to the Romagna. It enabled him, that's to say, to maintain his state. So Machiavelli wants to say his behaviour, which was cruel to, at the outset, had all these further consequences, which meant that it was far more merciful behaviour than the behaviour of the Florentines, who, to avoid a reputation for cruelty, allowed destruction instead. Now, here I draw to a close, but what I've been trying to say in these closing minutes is that Machiavelli's view about the virtues, the political virtues, is, I think, more complicated than has often been allowed. Certainly, he treats them all instrumentally. The question is always, will acting in a way that is held to be virtuous help you to maintain your state? Now, in the case of justice, he says, well, sometimes it will and sometimes it won't. And and in fact, not really sometimes, but the Italian says, often, spesso, you will have to avoid the, um, the virtue of justice. But when he turns to the other two princely virtues, it seems to me that the argument is rather different. He says, of course, you must only follow those virtues if you think that they will conduce to the maintenance of your state. But he thinks that true liberality always will and that true clemency always will. It's just that we live in a corrupt society in, what is in, in which what is called clemency is in fact just being overindulgent and facile and lax, and what is called liberality is just sumptuosity and display and extravagance. These are not virtues that will maintain your state because they're not virtues at all. The truly understood virtues, if you get around this redescription that everyone is going in for, will always help you to maintain your state. So how Machiavellian was Machiavelli? Entirely, I think, in the traditional picture in relation to the virtue of justice, but much more complicatedly in relation to the other two virtues. He's still an instrumentalist, he's still a complete consequentialist. He thinks that you should follow them if and only if they will maintain your state, but he thinks, rightly understood, they always will. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.